For those of you just joining us, I'm Frank Sisson from the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta and from the Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, which has organized this conference together with a number of sponsors whom you can find in this program and to which we are very grateful. Uh, most of you, or many of you, have been with us for two days, uh, and uh, you know that we have had a, a, a very rich discussion uh, of communism uh, and the effects of communism on famines in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, in the general Soviet famine, uh, in China, and we have expanded that uh, just in our last session to a discussion of North Korea. We could go beyond that and reach countries such as Ethiopia as well. Uh, it was for uh, REC, as we call our Holodomor uh, Research and Education Consortium, uh, an attempt to reach out beyond one region. And uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of such a reach. Uh, a, a, that reach often involves scholars to go on thin ice since we are not a specialist of everything, or most of us are not. Fortunately, for our lecturer today, we have someone uh, whose wide, wide range of specialities uh, enabled us uh, to organize this conference. Uh, I can say that really this conference uh, was the moving force the man with ideas for organizing the conference was Andrea Graziosi. Uh, that is, without him, we could have never been able to do such an event. Andrea Graziosi is professor on leave at the Université de Napoli Frederico Due, Federico Due, an associate of the Centre des Tours des, des Mondes Russes, uh, Caucasian et Centre European in Paris, a fellow of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and the Davis Center for Russian and Euro Eurasian Studies. In 2005, he was awarded the Order of Yaroslav the Wise for his studies on the Holodomor. He is the author of numerous books, collections, and above all, his study of the Soviet peasantry uh, and the relationship of the Soviet state uh, and the peasantry has shaped uh, the field and whole generations of scholars in it. I also think, uh, from the point of view of those interested in the Holodomor, it has been his research and nuanced discussion of the relationship of a all-Soviet famine that occurred in the 1930s and the specificity of the Holodomor in Ukraine uh, that has changed much of the thinking of the field and caused many scholars uh, to now adopt the vision uh, that not only the national interpretation of the uh, Holodomor must be taken seriously and is convincing, uh, but also the Holodomor fits in uh, the study of genocide. Uh, and in that, uh, uh, we have uh, been very grateful that he has served on the advisory board uh, of our new consortium. Uh, he sits on the, advisor, uh, the editorial boards of numerous academic journals. He has taught and lectured in several European and American universities. Uh, this several is, is it a way of copying out from a long list that we would have at this point in time. Uh, he is uh, a polyglot and uh, uh, does well in many languages. Uh, and as I think you will uh, hear today, a captivating speaker. Uh, his lecture today will be on Stalin and hunger as a nation-destroying tool. Professor Graziosi. So, after so many good words, of course, I'm going to be a big disappointment, <laughs> which is good. I already know I can only fail. So, uh, so I, the title, of course, is tricky because generally we are always thinking about nation building. We never speak about nation destroying. Uh, all the books are about nation building and nation building this, nation building that. And uh, actually, uh, I just invite you at the very beginning to stop for a second and realize that if you accept the idea that nation building is possible, you are implicitly accepting the idea that nation destroying is possible too. Because if you can build something, you can destroy that something. There is nothing eternal from this point of view. 
in this view. I'm not saying that it's correct. The second element that I would like to draw your attention to is the word nation. Because, of course, nation in English is a very general word and uh, generates a lot of misunderstanding when it's applied to the continental European experience. Uh, here I will use the word in the classical continental European way, which is the way, uh, since I'm Italian I may say so, not of Stalin but of Mazzini and uh, uh, of the, basically of the Italian uh, Risorgimento that imposed this conception, of course coming from the French, but mediated in a new way uh, to the European uh, intellectual milieu at the you know, in the mid-19th century. So the nation here is in the sense of continental European nation, is the sense in which Stalin used the term, Marxism and the national question, is not the nation in the way we understand it now uh, in the West. The civic nation, Canada. From this point of view, the United States are not a nation. Canada, as it is, is not a nation. From the point of view of Mazzini, I'm not saying it's wrong or right. I'm just saying this is what they thought. To be a nation, you needed a people with certain characteristics, and we will see why this is important. So the starting point of this is, of course, 1848. 1848, of course, is the spring of peoples, the revolution that brought the national program, from this point of view, at the center of European history. And since we are going to deal with Stalin and Marxism in many ways, uh, it is interesting to see the reaction of Marx and Engels to this. And the reaction of Marx and Engels to this idea of the nation and of the, especially of the small nation. Small here doesn't mean big or large or small in this sense. It means, you know, Hegel would have said people without history, that is peasant nations. They could be large as Ukraine, small as Czech, very small as Slovak, but the idea was these were non-historic nations. Nations that in the past had never had a state, or if they had a state, it was so long ago that this was forgotten, and so on and so forth. Of course, I'm using words that many people in the 19th century resented, but this is, was the general reading of the situation in Europe at that point. And the, the answer of Marx to the national question in 1848 was very clear. Both the nation and the peasants, that were the core of the na na nations, they were peasant nations, were phenomena of the past, were phenomena that were going to be erased. They were going to go to the dustbin of history, as you love to say. Uh, the Czech were German in the making. The Czech had no future. Well, not only the Czech had no future, they, they, he was not even thinking of Ukrainian, but uh, all these small people, small in the sense I told you before, had no future. It, it was, they were reactionary forces. Their nationalism was reactionary. Their, uh, the peasants behind their nationalism were reactionary forces influenced by the church. And really, they were relics of the past. There was, you know, there was nothing to be worried about them. The, I, I now, this is the situation in 18, 1848, and, and I'm, you know, after 30, 40 years, there has been the real modernization. I've been talking a lot about the modernization in these two days. Cities, industries, urbanization. By the 1880s, it was clear to the leader of the Ma Second International that what Marx had imagined was completely wrong that modernization was not taking these people to the dustbin, actually was strengthening them. Modernization was making these nations that seem to have no future into major forces on the political arena. And the first one who said so was Kautsky, you know, the famous leader of the Second International, started to, to reflect upon the, 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 the relationship between modernization and nationalism in these small peoples. But the real theoreticians about this were Bauer and Renner, the famous, at the time, Austro-Marxist. Austro -Marxist. And they turned Marx's theory upside down. They said, look, uh, it's simply not true. Pe both peasants and these small nations, that are very often peasant nations, 
get stronger and stronger because of modernization. They, they become political forces, they produce their own intelligentsia, they produce their own political parties, they become real actors on the political field, their aspirations are, get stronger and stronger, and we cannot presume they are going to disappear. Actually, we have to deal with the problem, because the problem is here to stay. Uh, and at this point, you know, this is very interesting, at this point, the, 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 the original Marxist theory was gone, basically, from this point of view, because they were realizing that these peoples were, were actually uh, becoming a growing power. But at this point, of course, there was this need. If these people are not going to disappear, how do we individuate? How do we single out these people? Who are these people? Uh, is it possible to, to, to make a list of them? What are their features? Uh, why I'm saying so? Because, you know, you, some of you, I hope not many, but some of you may have read um, uh, Marxism and the National Question, the very famous booklet by, by Stalin, 1913, written in Vienna, which, which is a polemic against Bauer, but actually takes basically much of Bauer's uh, basic argument. And you know, in that book, there is this definition of what is a nation, the, very, the five preconditions, the five characteristics of a nation. And you know, this is an interesting exercise. I tried to find out where those list of characteristics comes from, and it is straight from uh, a derivation of Mazzini via Mamiani, which is an important uh, Italian uh, nationalist intellectual. This is the Italian categorization of what is a nation, and I invite you to pay attention to this, because this is very interesting, because generally we are offered, especially in courses, at the, even at the very advanced university level, with two ideas of national, of, of what is a nation, the French and the German one, which is born out of the conflict uh, about Alsace and Lorraine, of course. And, you know, the German supposedly it's all uh, objective elements, blood, soil, history, and the French, the famous Renan quotation, it's all will, decision, subjective. Uh, uh, clearly, both these theories are very unelastic. Because what does it mean a plebiscite you know, the, of every day? That, or what does it mean that if you are uh, of a nation, you cannot stop being that nation? How many immigrants change the nationality? That is, both, both conceptions are very rigid. Instead, the, the definition that Bauer was taking from Mazzini and the Italian tradition is a very uh, elastic, very uh, uh, usable one, because it says it's true that there are objective characteristics, language, territories, you know the list, but in order to have a nation, you need also an organized will that is a party, that is a political organization. And, you know, I draw your attention on the fact that the first modern political party in the modern sense of an intellectual party is possibly the Italian Giovane, <laughs> Mazzini Giovane Italia, 1830, which is not a secret society. It's a party with a program, and the program is a national. And the idea is that Italy does not exist forever. Italy exists. There are some objective characteristics, but can come into being only because we want it to come into being. So in order to produce a nation, you have to will the nation. And to will the nation, you need you know, party, army, Garibaldi, and so on and so forth. You know, this idea that a nation then, it's the combination of objective and subjective elements, it already leads you to the fact that, of course, uh, a nation, there are objective elements, but you need to use them to build nations. And you build nations through, not the state, because the state is not there yet, but a party that you can interpret as a proto-state, if you want. A national party of a nation that is not get a state yet is a, a state project in, into being, I don't know, in, in progress. So this is what you have to, to keep in mind. So uh, let's start now with Stalin, because when we speak about, we will arrive at the Ukrainian crisis. Stalin, 1913, uh, you know, Lenin had enormous influence on him, is writing this booklet that I advise you to read. You know, the, the title was it's very significant, it was changing to Marxism and the 
national and colonial problem because Lenin extended the, this national concept to all the world, not just Europe, as it was, had been done by the Second International. So Indian or whatever, everybody had the right to will a nation if they uh, could do this. Uh, so the, 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 the the, the, the idea is that there are objective elements, there is a subjective element, and you can build upon this to create nations. And of course, the main objective element in this outline is language. It's not the only one, but it's the main element. And the main carrier are peasants. So the peasants, language, national will, the possibility of nation building linked to modernization are the great element of this new idea of nation building and the possible use of nationalism and peasant movements, of national movement and peasant movements to realize a communist revolution. I, I, we are here before the very, you know, this is the contrary of what Marx had said. In 1913, 1914, Lenin, because Stalin is actually following Lenin thinking, what Lenin is saying is that you can have a revolution, a socialist revolution, using the forces that in traditional Marx analysis are reactionary forces. And in fact, when Lenin, you, you remember this, when Lenin comes back in April 1917 with his thesis and says in Russia we can have a socialist revolution, remember, the, the party, even Stalin then was, you know, everybody thought he was crazy. The majority of the Bolshevik party reacted very badly to this. The, the man, the, the, he was in emigration, he does not understand anything about what is happening. And, and Lenin is telling you, look, we can make the revolution because we can use precisely the nationalities and the peasants against the Russian Empire. And, and the Bolshevik, the, there are interesting letters, say, but how can we use these reactionary forces? to further our aims. And he says, we can use them. And then once we are in power, we will see. <coughs> and and it's, it's very, to me, very significant that in some personal letters, they start to call him a magician, the Bolshevik leaders. Uh, Lenin is a magician because he's making what is impossible possible, using reactionary forces to, to make a socialist revolution. So you have a revolution that is predicated upon the a, a basic inner contradiction between the forces that you are using and the program you want to realize. Because of course the peasants and the nations are following you because you are telling them get the land that is become small owners, which is not socialism, or create your own nation, which is not an internationalist program at all. So you, you are having a socialist revolution with, with an inbuilt enormous tension between the forces you are using, because the proletariat was very small, there, there was almost none, between the forces and the categories you are using and the program you want to realize. This I think you have to understand. Then of course, there is the civil war experience. And the civil war experience proves at the same time how true, how, how right Lenin was and Stalin was. You remember Stalin was commissar of nationalities, that these peasants and nationalities could be used to win, and at the same time how dangerous this combination was. Because uh, think of Ukraine. Ukraine becomes really the center of this already in 1919, after the German occupation. Because at that point, uh, you go, you ride to power when the Germans are defeated, and you arrive in Kiev, you know, uh, uh, riding the wave of the peasant detachment, the peasant guerrilla, uh, armies that bring you and betray the directorate and, uh, and, and betray actually the, the, the Ukrainian National Socialist parties and, and give the power to the Bolsheviks. But they, they are putting you there because they think you are something else. You want something else. And when the Bolsheviks in 1919, because at that point they were convinced that the world revolution was coming. You remember, these are the high hopes after the November crisis in Germany, the, the end of the empire, the, the Hungarian revolution. Ni 1919 is the high moment of socialist hopes in Europe. Lenin decides that all the cautions are to be abandoned and you can implement the, 
the original program. And so you can have collectivization, you can have communes in the countryside, and you can do without all these national elements and the Ukrainian language and uh, speaking about, you know, the, the, and you can impose through internationalism, meaning Russia. And you know, you remember, I don't have to teach this to you, that already by the summer of 1919 in Ukraine, the government, the Bolshevik government, was collapsing because of Ukrainian peasants' insurrection. And, that, and this is a lesson that remained in Stalin's, and not only in Stalin's mind, if you read his letters, his correspondence, up to the end, at least up to the 30s, then World War II changed the picture, of course. You have huge peasants' insurrection behind the lines, and of course the whites or Petlura or the Poles profit of this to attack you and defeat you. This is the, the real m way you are defeated. You have peasants' insurrection because you have done something wrong with the peasants, attacking them on both the national and the land question, after using them and promising them, and then you have this insurrection and you cannot resist outside forces. So the real mechanism, if you read the trials of 1930, what Kandratiev and the other are accused of, is precisely this. They are preparing this. So uh, the, 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 it is important also for Stalin personally, because as you know, Stalin, uh, as a state builder, uh, is a man of the Southern Front, meaning the Caucasus and Ukraine. He was the head of the Southern uh, party committee on the southern front is following where people from the Donbass, Budionny, Varashilov, Haganovich, uh, and from the Caucasus, Mikhoyan, Orjonikidze. Uh, so Stalin was really a man of these southern places where the national and the social were really uh, mingled and constituted both an explosive uh, social national material for revolution and an explosive material for endangering Bolshevik power. So how do they come out of this? They come out of this, of the defeat, because this was the most serious defeat the Bolshevik ever experienced, the 1919 defeat in Ukraine, by far. I don't think there is any, uh, this was a total collapse of a Bolshevik government. They come up, if you read the famous letter that Lenin sent and then Stalin sent, uh, they come out saying two things. First, you have we made a mistake in favoring Russian and imperialism, calling it internationalism. We have to do Korenitsatsia. That is, we have to take back, you know, the national problem. There is a fantastic Lenin letter, I won't... Uh, and, and, you know, Korenitsatsia, meaning indig indigenization, that is the adoption of traditional extreme national policies, nation-building policies, came in 1923, but in Ukraine is foreshadowed by uh, already in the, in the late 1919. And uh, this is really what, what the, the solution. And the other le le lesson that Stalin and Lenin learned is that you don't want anymore to, to mix the social and the national together. Because if you carry a fight against the peasantry, both on the social land and the national language, uh, uh, front, you are going to, uh, maybe you are going to win after all, but this is going to be a ma major disaster anyway, a real major fight. Uh, so actually, if you, of course, I have to go very fast, but if you think of the 20s, uh, what Stalin does in the 20s is a solid alliance with the Ukrainian National Communist, very solid, you remember, after a some hesitation because of the Donbass, the Donbass real is a key uh, we know this very well these days, unfortunately, but it's a real key to, to understanding Ukrainian uh, relation, relation with Russia and Ukrainian history since, since many, many decades ago. The idea is, you know, uh, since the Ukrainian National Communists and all the National Communists, the main enemy is Trotsky, because Trotsky is, um, you know, internationalist, there's no feeling for peasants, for nationalities, for small nationalities. Uh, Trotsky is their enemy, I am their friend, so I am having a big alliance with all these national groups against Trotskyism. 
And basically, up to 1927, Stalin is very faithful to this, in spite of, you know, problem with Chomsky in Ukraine. But still, when he sends, you know, these are always the same people. We know this well. When Kaganovich is sent in Ukraine in the 20s, it is to enforce Ukrainizatia very strongly. Then in 32, he's sent to destroy you. Ukrainization in the Kuban, in the Caucasus. But it's the same people, again, building, destroying, you know. The, the. And so these people are, up to the late 20s, very much united. The idea is that for them, and even for somebody like Rushevsky, if you read his correspondence after he comes back to Ukraine, uh, you know, in the 20s, the idea is that actually you can do nation building under socialism. You can be do, since they understood the problem, you can do nation building in Soviet, in a Soviet context. This is the bet. And actually this can be very effectively done. And so that, uh, you know, state building, nation building, Ukrainian building, we are speaking about Ukraine, but this applies to, to many, many other republics, can go together. And how are these people, because they all know that the peasants are their real basis. How come these people, to, to, to pick up what Professor Bianco discussed yesterday, how come these people, I'm speaking about the Ukrainian, because I will stick to Ukraine now, uh, how come these people that knew very well that the peasants were their main supporters of the Ukrainian idea, uh, were ready to support Stalin, uh, the great turning point, the great industrialization and collectivization scheme that the new peasants were not going to like. Because they also thought that peasants were a weak element in nation building. That with peasants you did not go far. Because the peasants were not solid. In order to have a real independent solid Ukraine you needed to conquer the cities. You didn't need to you, can, you couldn't go far away with, with just peasants. You need to Ukrainize the big cities. And if you think of the promise implicit in speed industrialization, but not even implicit, Stalin told, told this openly, if I give you very speed industrialization and I will bring millions of Ukrainian peasants to the cities, the cities will be yours. And you know that Stalin was on paper saying that the cities belong to the surrounding countryside. This is stated already when it, it was giving Vilnius to the, to, to the Lithuanian and not to the Poles. And this was his line, that uh, cities that do not belong to their inhabitants, they belong to the countrysides that feed them. Of course, he then was ready to, 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 to do a lot of things to avoid this with the Russian-Ukrainian cities, but still the principle. And the, 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 the Ukrainian communists believed this, and I think they went with it because they had this, like, mirage, this, this idea they could have these cities eventually. They could have a real Ukraine with real cities that were real Ukrainized. And they were ready for this, of forgetting, or, because, of course, when you launch such a big transformative project as the great turning point. Of course, uh, as everybody knows, when you launch a great transformative project, uh, you have immediate centralization effect. Because if there is a big transformation project, you have to centralize things. So already by 1929-30, the, the local commissariats, the Republic, were losing powers. The high local intelligentsia was being, you know, put aside. You remember Skripnik was already worried in 1930 because of the SVU trial. Uh, this applied also to Russia, by the way, not, not just to Ukraine, because in Russia too there were phenomena like this. So that even though there were elements that this uh, attack, uh, this big transformative project was creating problems with the peasants and with the traditional base of the national movement, still they still could believe uh, that the main objective was going to be reached. And Stalin was, go back to the, you, you just have to go back to the, the lesson of 1919. Stalin was paying a lot of attention on this. He was telling them, I'm giving you Ukrainization. Ukrainization is not going to be turned back. It's true that we are having a problem with the Ukrainian peasants. In 1930, you know, there were uh, not insurrection is too big a word, but big revolts in the countryside. 
but this is because of the land problem. We know that the peasants do not like the land. This belongs to the transformative project. You will have a stronger Ukraine when you will not have individual peasants. Uh, so this can be accepted. Of course, the first doubts are already there. Oh, today, Bodan Creed quite rightly said uh, the national interpretation is not only Stalin. Uh, the Ukrainian National Communists, too, starting already in 1930, start to have doubt about what they had been doing in 1928, 1929. They start to have doubt, but still they continue, since they continue to control more or less their own republic, they continue to support this. Uh, at this point, of course, there is the, what I will not uh, analyze because this is well known, we've been discussing this, of course, the, 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 the great turning point brings upon the country a major crisis, a major food crisis, a major productivity crisis, a major investment crisis, a major export crisis, import-export crisis, because it was so poorly conceived, it was so poorly executed, and because peasants didn't like it, and because there were a lot of, uh, you know, even the kulakization was such a mistake from this point of view, politically not, of course. Uh, so, from 1930 on, you have the growing of these contradictions I was telling you about. First, you have peasants that resist, not so much physically, because the, 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 the village have no arms whatsoever in 1930. The arms have been combed away in the 20s. But still, you have a big opposition of the villages to collectivization. You have a drop in productivity. You have peasants that are calling collectivization second serfdom in all the OGPU documents. So they are not accepting this. They don't like this. And they make it very clear. You have growing difficulties in getting grain in exporting and thus in importing things, you have a growing crisis, economic crisis. And of course, uh, here we are close to what we, we know about China. Uh, at the top, I'm, I'm seeing things from the top. Of course, to Stalin, this is very threatening because uh, the situation, the crisis that has been caused by his policies is causing big, big problems. Of course, the, the largest problem was not a politically terrible problem for, me, for him. This is Kazakhstan. We know that in Kazakhstan, uh, yesterday we are the step, already by 1931, the famine was a terrible fact. We know that by 1932, a, 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 let's say 30% of the Kazakh population had died by the end of 32, more or less, and that a lot of many, many other Kazakhs had emigrated, both to China, to other Soviet republics. So there had been already a nation destroying that was already there, though not willed. Not, you know, uh, unless you, you, you have to say that, of course, since this was pro provoked by excessive meat requisition and grain requisition, this was produced by the center policies, which is absolutely true. But nobody wanted to destroy the Kazakh nation. Nobody thought in this term. And, and, and we know that Stalin was informed, just as all the others, they didn't care, basically. So by 1932, you already had a major famine with its own internal dynamic that was different from what happened elsewhere. And you started to have <coughs> serious elements of crisis uh, in Ukraine and in other republics. The most serious developments took place in Ukraine in the spring of 1932. This we know very well. Uh, I will not, this has been the most important archival discovery. By the spring, the majority of the leaders of the Ukrainian Communist Party were resenting, you know, were thinking they made the wrong choice. If you read Skripnik's statement or Petrovsky's statement, even Kosior, uh, Chubar, <coughs> they are saying there are local famines, the local famines, because local famines are always in the spring, the one caused by excessive requisition, because you take too much away, by, by March food is over, and then you are left April and May without food, more or less. So uh, they are saying we did a horrible thing. We, are we started to have collectivization, socialism, whatever, uh, 
uh, in the speed industrialization and we are ending with the feminine, this is Scripni speaking, the peasant and saying it's our fault. It's like reading Liu Shaoqi. Uh, the peasants say it's all our, the communist fault. This is what they are, and these are, they are sell it, saying open, and the word famine is openly used in the official internal, of course, correspondence with Stalin. We have a famine, you have to help us, this famine is caused by us, we have to take, from this point of view, it's very similar to what uh, was happening in China at the end of 58, the beginning of 59, when the information about the disaster caused by the Great Leap Forward was reaching the center, and the center said, what, what have we done? And, you know, Stalin actually did give some help at that point, real help, not the, the selective help to, 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 to win the, the war against the peasants and the, nation, and the Ukrainian nation of one year later. Uh, but he started to convince himself that the problem in Ukraine, in spite of all the care he had taken to avoid the combination of the social and the national, the, this combination was there again. And actually, this combination this time was embodied by none other than the Ukrainian Communist Party and its leading group. The Ukrainian Communist Party was the carrier. You know, you remember the famous Stalin letter in which they say, party, ha, 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 they are all Petri Wright and Pilsudski agent. They, this is not a party. This is a spy organization. This is, uh, uh, that is weird. And, and the letter say, ends saying, you know, we, we risk losing Ukraine. And we risk losing Ukraine because we have against us the peasants, the Ukrainian national communists, the Ukrainian intelligentsia, because we, as much as we try to avoid this, our nation building and socialist building entered into contradiction, and now we are having a way, like in 1919, of opposition based on both the social and the national question. And this is deadly. If we have this, the regime is over. If you put this, if you project this against the backdrop of this huge crisis in which the country was because of the great, of the great turning point, you remember only in Kazakhstan there were 1.3, 1.5 million dead, you know, because of hunger. Uh, and the whole country was more or less starving, even, and there were pockets of famine in many places. And the peasants didn't want, uh, didn't accept the second serfdom. Uh, and, and if you follow, I don't have the time, if you follow Stalin reasoning, do we have still 15 minutes? Yes. If you follow Stalin reasoning uh, from the law of August 7, you know, the famous law against peasant theft, in which somebody who is stealing a small amount of grain to feed a kid uh, is to be sentenced to death or to minimum 10 years in jail. You know, you, you steal a uh, few seeds to feed a kid and you are going to be shot or to sent to, to, to a camp for 10 years. He justifies this in very uh, theoretical terms, in a long, very long document in which he says we have to teach peasants uh, how to respect socialist property, state property, precisely as this was done by the capitalists and so on and so forth. At the, so yes, and, and he's starting to, to, to say openly, and this is already the experience of World War, not only of the Civil War, but also of World War I, of the fact that people that did not work did not deserve to eat. That in order to be able to eat, you needed to work. If you didn't work for the collective farm, you had no entitlement to food. This, this is another recurring, and this too is very, you know, it's a very ideological uh, tradition, even though one can say, you know, that this, the use of hunger as a tool, as, as a weapon, uh, is the basic tool of World War I. If you think of British strategy against Germany, the encirclement and the, and the fact that the food and not to reach the central empires, this was the same idea. You had to starve them to submission. That is, this was the official uh, Allied power strategy vis-a-vis -vis Germany. The idea of using food as a weapon was in the main European culture after World War I with great strength. So at this point, uh, there is a big uh, change brought about by, you know, the crisis becomes more and more acute. Uh, 
you know, the wife, uh, Stalin's wife commits suicide. There are party members that call uh, about killing Stalin, tyrannicide. There are official documents circulated. And, and the Politburo does not want to persecute the author. Uh, the crisis is undeniable. There are the, the Kazakh, there is the Kazakh tragedy. There is the situation in Ukraine. Uh, there is something is needed. From this point of view, because we are having a comparative, this is really uh, comparable to the Lushan conference. It's a crucial turning point. And in the Soviet Union, this comes in October, November 32. And the solution that Stalin comes about it is, again, a solution very sophisticated, unfortunately, because the man, as I tried to say, the man is not a banal, stupid bureaucrat. He's a, a self-taught, rigorous, merciful, cruel intellectual. The, the, the solution is we have to face and to deal with both the social and the national together. We have to starve peasant into submission. We have to eliminate the Ukrainian national communists. We have to eliminate the Ukrainian intelligentsia. We have to eliminate all elements of uh, Ukrainization of the cities, school, dictionaries, even the vocabulary, the, 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 the transliteration and the alphabet and so on and so forth. And all these elements are implemented in few weeks, in decrees that are approved one after the other in few weeks. So, of course, I don't think we will ever find a document that says, uh, you know, we are going to do this. But we have all the decrees that implement a very coherent, very surprisingly coherent strategy. Very intelligent, I have to say, unfortunately. A very rigorous strategy that says, we, since we have been doing nation building based on peasants and education, basically, and language, we are going to have nation destroying based on the fact that they will have to accept our own terms in productive unit, our own social organization. They will stop speaking Ukraine if they immigrate to the cities. They will not have their intelligentsia and their party anymore. They will not have an independent, autonomous body. And this, has, this is implemented in, you know, in very few weeks. It's very impressive. Uh, the requisition, because it's true, you know, I, I, I draw your attention before, I drew your attention before to the fact that Holodomor is very special because most of these 3.5, 4 million people that died, because up to the, 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 the spring of 32, meaning up to the end of 32, basically, only 200,000, only, huh? quotation mark, enormous, but still only 200,000 people had died because of starvation over four years in Ukraine. And, you know, we now know that about 4, 4.3, 3.8, I would say 4.3 now seems the most, but let's say 4. 4 million people died. They died because of the requisition of late, starting in late November and ending in January. So this requisition took away most of the food, not all, because most of the family were able to, you know, hit something or hide something. This is normal. So I would say the normal family, not the very unlucky one, not the very weak one with old people and babies, was able to eat something until March. And then food is over. Not everywhere. This again is a proof that this was, you know, a very, uh, on the border region, food was continued to arrive. In the south, more or less, the situation was not as bad. Where this is focused is the Kharkiv and Kiev Oblast and the parts of others. And these are, by the way, the, ob the regions where the great revolts of 1919, you know, Bielatsyev had been. And that, it doesn't mean that he's killing all Ukrainians, because of course, in these regions, all the small villages were Jewish tet. I think one can claim that most of the Jewish tetl are wiped out almost in, in the spring of 1933, because people were not, so it's not that uh, this means that it's only after Ukrainian, but the idea is to break the Ukrainian. Uh, I think he's reasoning in a statistic way, not in a, uh, let's say, in a, you know, a single, by single, you know, he used to love the expression, when you cut a forest, uh, you don't know what happens, you know, the important thing is that you cut the forest. So the, the, the people starts to die in 
by the end of March. And by the end, of course, there are still massive deaths in July, but the most of people died between April and May and June. This is extremely concentrated and complex. There is not such a thing. I don't know of any other famine that is so concentrated and specific. And if you take all the other, uh, um, how to say, all the other measures against the Ukrainization, the dictionaries, the spelling, uh, the, the destruction of the socialists, you know, if you take Rushevsky, Rushevsky is in Moscow and the rights have been building this and that, all this is being destroyed. Rushevsky is not killed, he's just deported to Moscow. But really, there is a complete destruction of everything that had been done between 1919, 1923, up to 1932. And I think you can, and I'm going to finish, uh, you, you are having here a person that is able to apply precisely what I told you about at the beginning, a model in which nation building is possible because there are objective elements and there is a will, a political will, and the political actor that can use these objective elements to build the nation. Uh, and, but this very political actor can decide, because it's possible, to, to use the political will and the political tool and violence to destroy and not to build. And I think uh, by you know, May, June 33, Stalin won this. This is another huge difference between China and uh, Stalin and Mao. Uh, by, by the summer of 33, if you read the letters of the Stalinists, they are celebrating victory. We won over the peasants. We won over the Ukrainians. We won, we won our victory. The Congress, I repeated this many times, but this is very important. It, in China, it's unthinkable. The, the, the Congress in China in 61 is a, uh, 62 is a Congress of despair. In, 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 in Soviet Union, they call it the Congress of Victors because they had crushed the enemy. And they crushed the social enemy and the national enemy, which in Ukraine, in Ukraine were uh, two parts of the same. So I think here you have really uh, uh, something new and different based on a theoretical basis. That is, you are having somebody who is thinking in theoretical terms, not, not in uh, banal or... Uh, uh, responding day by day because it's cruel or because it's uh, uh, vicious. Of course, Stalin was cruel, but it, this is not element. You have somebody who is applying theory in order to further his aims. And I think if you go, I will finish with this. You know, there is this very famous 1952 uh, discussion between Stalin and the delegation of the Ukrainian Communist Party. And, and the Ukrainian Communist Party Politburo delegation went to Stalin to tell him that the, the how do you say, the procurement were good in Ukraine. Then Stalin tells them, aha, this is very interesting because you know the history of mankind knows many tragic cases in which entire nations died out because of lack of bread and were thus cancelled from history. This is Stalin speaking with the Ukrainian Politburo in 52. I think that it's not to say that he's telling them what he had done, but in a way it is. That is, I've been using hunger not to destroy forever the objective elements, because of course Stalin knew that this was impossible. But he had imposed another recombination of those elements, which is Soviet Ukraine, taming the original project. And you know, he was able this way to dominate the course of Ukrainian events for many decades. Fortunately, you know, since there is history, nation building started again, took other forms, uh, the diaspora played a role, the development in Russia and the Soviet Union played another role. So it's not that history was over with this. History is never over. This is very good. Uh, history continues. So, uh, but, but he certainly was able this way to impose his recasting of nations. And the same applies also to Kazakhstan, even if he didn't want it. Because as Nicolò and Sarah told us, in Kazakhstan, the new Kazakhstan was born out of the famine. So there too, the famine was a nation recasting, besides of it being a nation destroying tool. And so to end the comparative conference, if I've now been asked the main difference between Stalin and Mao, of course, Mao made a bigger mistake was even more, if you want, adventurous and 
if I may say so, uh, not realistic and uh, his famine produced, you know, 40 million, 35 million, I don't know, some say 45 even, but let's say many, many more millions dead that in the Soviet Union. But I don't think you can accuse Mao of really wanting this as a, an end result. I think this applies also to Stalin compared to the famine, uh, the general famine of 32. He never wanted the general famine. He never wanted the, the Kazakh tragedy as it happened. It happened because it was an unfortunate result of meat requisition. But as far as Ukraine is concerned, I think the discourse is very different. There, I think you have uh, the result of a political, organized, and well taught action. And from this point of view, I think that famine was consciously used as a nation destroying tool in Ukraine. Of course, not forever. If, if one may be not destroying, recasting in a bad way is, is the solution. Thank you very much. So I take two, three questions and then I answer yeah. them. Yeah. You, you will lead them. I'm Gil Ivanov, University of Wisconsin. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, speech. You mentioned Mazzini, Stalin, and Mao in the same uh, half an hour or so. And so my question is on the impact of Mazzini on Stalin and Mao, and let me rephrase that. Um, language was a very important characteristic of uh, objective uh, tool of evaluating and building a nation. This is what Mazzini envisioned. Uh, a nation has to have a language. But in the 19th century, Mazzini's vision of a nation wasn't the only one available in Europe. There was also Lajos Kossuth, who said that language has nothing to do with a nation. You could have Slovak-speaking Hungarians. You can have Rusin, uh, Ukrainian-speaking Hungarians. Everybody is a Hungarian. What is interesting to me is why did Soviet Marxists adopt Mazzini's version of, of uh, nationalism, what a nation is, to such a degree that language became important um, in carving out who's a Kyrgyz, who's a Kazakh, Tatars, Bashkirs, I mean, they're very similar languages. But in Mao's China, the ca canonical uh, authority of language wasn't as strong. I mean, you did have Hakka and Mongols, but you know, Shanghai's language is fairly, or dialect is fairly different from what they speak in Beijing, but it's still it's one nation. So why was the spirit of Mazzini so strong in, I mean, this is Hegelian, I know, in, in um, Soviet Marxism, but perhaps not as strong in, as in No, but I, I think, yeah, no, since the question is, I suppose, different from the other, I never claimed that Mazzini had any influence on China, never. No, no. It, clearly had a huge influence on Stalin. And this because Stalin and Lenin thinking on nationality were shaped by Bauer. And actually, when you study Bauer's sources, Bauer's sources are the study of what is happening in Austro-Hungary. That is the fact that modernization is not putting these small nationalities in the dustbin. It's actually giving them power, as the Czech student proved in Prague Street when they beat up the German student and they imposed the creation of a Czech university. And because uh, he is taking the Italian theory through, uh, this is very, when I retrace this, it's very funny, that this was a very small adventure. Uh, because there is this quotation, this, the, 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 Stalin takes these five points out of Bauer. So I went to check Bauer's book, which is interesting, but also very boring. And, and you read Bauer's book, and the Bauer takes this from a German collection from an Italian sociologist. So who was this Italian sociologist? At many, I followed many hypotheses. At the end, it's Terenzio Mamiani, who was an important uh, 
uh, Italian intellectual and a follower of Mancini, who gave precisely those, we before I thought it was Mancini, then I thought it was uh, another one, but, but it actually was Terenzi Mamiani. So actually, this, you know, this happens because ideas do circulate, and do circulate also in a very unpredictable way. So that uh, this definition of the nation based on territories, common culture, and history, and psychology, and language as the main element, was taken over by Stalin, and uh, it's canonized in Marx. You, you open the, the, and it's open by that. And this has become the standard way in which the communist movement has defined the nation. So it's as simple as that. I don't know, and, and you know, Kosciuszko was highly unpopular because it's true that he said that the Slovaks were, were Hungarian, but Slovaks didn't like the idea very much, if I may say so. That is, maybe some Slovaks liked the idea, but the majority seemed not to. You remember he refused to have breakfast with them because they were not. Uh, so I would say that the, the, the Italian theory was more popular. And also you have to, to understand the meat of people like Garibaldi, like the, the influence. And by the way, Stalin, you know, Stalin in his youth was not a Marxist, he was a nationalist. This is well known by now. He was a Georgian nationalist. He wrote horrible nationalist poems uh, of very poor quality. And, and, and actually, the culture he absorbed when he was you know, a very young adolescent infected with you know, national ideas were the predominant culture of nationalism, language, what they call small people national language in Europe, and in continental Europe. And this was that culture. It was neither the French culture that was more sophisticated, nor the German uh, objective. You know, the, the German was not so popular. So, please. Can I just say something about China, which of language? Um, first of all, you have to remember that um, um, in China, there is unified written script. There was not Either the case practice. in the Soviet Union, and Mao did not do that. It was done, you know, the, during the time of the first emperor. So that is the difference. Um, then um, on the issue, you are talking about, you know, kind of um, and the the Shanghai language, uh, you know, dialect is very really different. We talk to the microphone. Well, um, there was no attempt to wipe out all this dialect. There was um, um, after communist took over China in 1949, they um, introduced a literacy program. Um, in this, through this literacy program, people were forced to learn Mandarin. Um, I actually have, in my oral history book, I have an interview about people talking about, you know, that the Cantonese were forced to learn language, uh, to learn Mandarin. The like imperial what, what, yeah. I think she's right. You have to consider that in China there was ideograms. You could read that the ideogram meant the same thing to everybody and you could pronounce it in many different ways. So the written culture was basically unified. I think she's very right. The thing changed with television and radio, of course, because then pronunciation became the key. Uh, the issue of uh, internal colonialism was raised a number of times. And I also wonder, um, in the previous session, you mentioned that uh, Stalin, although uh, never condoned the uh, official discourse on internal colonization, but in, in, the, in the circle, that's, that was the way he talked about it. So I wonder where that sort of the notion and ideas of uh, colonialism uh, that Stalin adopted came uh, from 1913 uh, pamphlet that he was writing was national colonial question. Never actually was about colonial question to the extent that he used. So where that so ideas came from, and I uh, just want to reiterate the question I asked last session, but didn't have a chance to have any answer to if you could what is the pivotal characteristic of internal colonial that we can apply to other places as well. Okay. I have to say, as he knows, I am not so convinced by this colonial argument in the Soviet case, if I may say so. Uh, it's true that in the Kazakh case there are evident objective elements that can lead you to, to use the term colonialism. But first of all, you have to remember that when they, that the book was called Marx is a booklet, Marxism and the National Question. Then when the, there was the National Liberation Movement in Asia, 
the title was changed to Marxism and the nation and the colonial question to mean that the national liberation was to be extended to the colonial. So it was a pro-liberation from colony discourse. So the official discourse was always anti-colonial and remained anti-colonial to the very end of the Soviet Union. Uh, the, and when they spoke in private about internal colonies, they never spoke of nations. They only spoke of the peasantry, Russian, Ukrainian, Kazakh, as internal colonies. So the internal colony was a social class or a social group, was never a nation. They never conceived of a nation as a colony, even in private. This is why I have a lot of problem with adopting the colonial language for analyzing the Soviet reality. Because it's true that they spoke of treating peasantry as an internal colony. You know, the famous, the line is, the, 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 the intellectual model is Marx's chapter on primi primitive accumulation. And the, the, the occasion is the fact that, of course, the, as much as the American bankers wanted to give money to the Soviet Union in the 20s, as soon as they tried, the French banks uh, immediately started action to seize the assets of American banks. Because since the, the, the Russian, you know, had for, how do say, refused to pay the Russian debt, and the Russian debt was basically in French and Belgian hands, as soon as somebody dealt with the Soviet Union financially, the French Central Bank and the French banks started the legal action to prevent the Soviet Union from receiving. Uh, as, as, as a matter of fact, the Bolsheviks already in private by 1925 were saying that the default of 1917 had been the greatest mistake ever they ever committed because they cut out cut them out from the international financial market. So uh, at, at this point, and many bankers, communist bankers, left-leaning bankers were telling this to them already in 1917. Don't do this. This is going to be a terrible mistake. You don't want to, do, to have a default. Uh, but the, 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 the reference is precisely the lack of money to carry out industrialization. And they say that the, the, you know, the capitalists, because they had this Marxist scheme that in order to invest, you have to accumulate, to extract a surplus first, which is, of course is not true because we know that in, in a market economy, you don't have to, to have already a capital of your own. You can go to the market precisely. But in that case, uh, is applying the Marxist logic is saying, since we, banks do not give us money because of our mistake, uh, it's not important. We cannot exploit the workers because we are socialists. Remember, this is 26, 20, 26 basically, 27. Uh, no, but we have no colonies to exploit. This is said openly in the same, again, so how much can you use the colonial argument? We have no colonies to exploit. Then the only people we can exploit are the peasants. So let's treat the peasants as our internal colony by imposing them a tribute. So the, the, log, the danya, as it was called. So the logic is to impose a tribute on the peasantry. This is the, the, the private discourse, because in public we are going to say that we will have collectivization that will improve the lot of the peasants as well. So again, and by 1930-31, by Stalin knew that no tribute was coming from the countryside. That, that, that is, this was clear, because this was Tell my catastrophe, how do you say, uh, such a catastrophe he had provoked in the countryside that he was not getting anything out of it. Actually, you know, by now, e economic historians, and with this I finish, all agree that 1928, 1933, in economic terms, is a big loss for the Soviet Union. The national income precipitated, collapsed. So uh, th these are, you know, tricky questions at least. Please. Thank you. Um, just as we come to the end of our, our discussion from the last two days, something's been sort of nagging at me, and, um, and that is actually this question of the end of history, um, uh, which you raised briefly, but I think in reference to another context. But of course, this idea of the end of history, in a sense, is Marx's idea that, that once communism arrives, we've, we've ended up at the ultimate moment. Um, and uh, I think that in the Great Leap Forward, one of the most prominent themes or, or, or issues that was being debated within the, the, the party at that time was how quickly, how quickly they could arrive at communism 
and there were different views about what the length of time that was going to be required. Um, and, um, and so there was this, um, uh, so first of all, this idea that, that they were, in fact, or some people were arguing that there was this possibility of arriving at communism um, within a matter of years. My question really has to do with how the Soviets were looking at this and, and the interaction between Mao and the Soviets in this moment, because my understanding and my teaching about this has always been that um, Mao, in fact, was thumbing his nose <laughs> at the Soviets and saying, look, we can, in fact, you know, embrace this um, you know, idea of subjective initiative. China can even outpace you um, by, by, by working through this Maoist approach, right? Um, and, and whereas my understanding of the Soviets looking on, at, at China was, you're crazy, and, and, and that you know, this is going to be a, a disaster. Um, but again, we've been sort of comparing these two famines, um, and, 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 and we've talked about what Mao knew of the earlier famine, but we have these Soviets and the Soviet advisors um, perplexed and frustrated and, and eventually pulling out. And so I'm just wondering if you could comment on that for a minute, because you'd also said a little bit earlier today, or someone had said that this was a moment of euphoria, the Sputnik moment, right? So I'm wondering if you could just pull that together quickly, because we haven't mm -hmm. talked about that interaction. Yes. First of all, let's remember that, of course, the great turning point aim was not communism, but was the building of socialism. Yes, and right. for m Stalin, this was clear that these were two different things. Right, First, you needed to build socialism, yes. and this was declared achieved in 1936, as you may remember. In 1936, when they passed the Constitution, they said that socialism meant be built in the Soviet Union. So communism then became the aim. But this is very interesting, and we brought us this up, because uh, this is why, in a way, Khrushchev was more like Mao than like Stalin. Let's say we have built socialism. So we have to go up and build communism. This is right. So Khrushchev in 1950, I think it's 1950, says, let's go and build communism. And Stalin says, you are a complete fool. Communists cannot be built. Uh, Kolkosi cannot be abolished. You have to wait. The money cannot be abolished. Money has to remain. We cannot manage an economy without money, which is an admission that communism is never going to come, because in Marx's theory, you know, communism is without money. And Stalin is not saying, I know why this is impossible, because this would have been like saying communism is impossible, it's all wrong. It's just saying we cannot discuss this. You're a fool. You remember that when Khrushchev went to power, he started to speak about communism. In fact, in 1961, if I'm not mistaken, 62, I think, he promised communism within uh, 20 years, right? And, and actually, this was so embarrassing for later leaders like Brezhnev that this was removed from history because he believed that communism was coming and, of course, was never coming. And, and so it's true that at that moment there was this high expectation of, of uh, that in the Soviet Union, I would say, was only Khrushchev, basically. I don't think there were many other big leaders that were, you know, in a way, Khrushchev, it's true that he thought Mao was crazy, Mao, you know, there are the famous letters, but in a way, he was also an admirer, you know, I think he, he, he thought Mao really knew really could do a great leap. I would like to do a great leap myself. You know, in a way, he was trying to have a small leap, Khrushchev, in 57, 50, uh, 58. So uh, I think you are right to contextualize the, the atmosphere of late 50s, early 60s, that is this atmosphere. And from this point of view, uh, in my view, this is the moment in which communism as an ideology is defeated all over the world, because it's true that then it lingered in the... But after 61 in China, this was a complete catastrophe, the, the, the famine and, the, and then the great cultural revolution. And in the Soviet Union, it was shame at the very idea that Khrushchev had mentioned, you know, that communism could be built in 20 years, and nobody said anything. They started to invent 
new strata, you know, the so developed socialism, mature developed socialism, because they couldn't get uh, anywhere close to communism. That clearly was, you know, something that could not be, it was just a wild idea at that point. So I think you can, you can speak of a high moment of hopes in, in the leadership, of course. I'm not speaking of the, of the people, I'm speaking of the leaders, at least part of the leaders. And by the beginning of the 60s, if you think of the Soviet leadership reaction to Khrushchev, Khrushchev was considered an embarrassment and the person to get rid of already by 1962 by most Soviet leaders. And in 64, he's put on pension, you know, he's retired, as they say. <laughs> So I, I, think, I think you have a point, but it's not Stalin. Stalin was going to build socialism, this he did, and that was it. Okay, now that we have, we have 15 minutes left for discussion, uh, if anyone wants to get So I will, I will that, give very short speak. answers. And, and if you want to collect questions, that yes. would be good as well. Okay, so that we can have... Hi, uh, Louis Lu, international consultant. Uh, I recall an uh, old story, actually, the... Uh, when, when the kids, when the young people wish the food, the older people that tell an older story say, uh, when they're hard of time or something, the people are hungry to die. I think that they're relevant to the past two days, the conference. Not to say they're, uh, they're trying to, uh, in their continued couple of years, no harvest. In the, in the line because of the natural disaster, the joy. That's one thing. At the same time, the Soviet Union stopped all the support the program to China. And uh, at the same time, they pushed China to return all board the day. So that had to come to the uh, very difficult time that people no food to fit in the stomach. I, I learned that for the very little, when you wish the food, you know, the older people tell you something like that. I think that's a relevant with their uh, subject you, you talk about, hunger to die. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, uh, at present, the, uh, the uh, um, battles that are occurring in Ukraine um, uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the uh, Russian-speaking and Russified um, Eastern, Far Eastern part of Ukraine, and, and of course the, uh, the purported incursion of, of Russian soldiers into that region is seen in part as a question, um, an issue over the um, the Russian question in that part of Ukraine. And I am wondering whether there is um, information or evidence as to whether after the period of the Holodomor. And as well, after the uh, two incursions by the Germans, by the Nazis, into Ukraine as far as, let's say, Kharkiv and slightly beyond, and the subsequent um, diaspora of many Ukrainian refugees from that heavily industrialized part of the Ukraine um, was, was a cause of possible Russian national migration into that, uh, that region, especially into the industrialized cities, perhaps, you know, in seeking employment, but as well, was there any possibility that this might have been used uh, as a furtherance of, you know, your, what you were talking about earlier of attempting to quell um, Ukrainian nationalism in that part of Ukraine? So is there evidence possibly of um, an intentional, let's say, movement of Russians into that region then so that now there is this Russian question. Very much, let's say, like the policy of China has been with Tibet in calling Tibetan nationalism by moving large numbers of, um, of Chinese nationals, nationals into, into Tibet. So I'm wondering if there's evidence there for that part of Ukraine. And then a second question I have is um, whether there are still resonances of the old themes of Pan-Slavism from the 19th century and even perhaps resonances of the old theme of Russia as the third Rome in, um, in some of the, let's say, the spirit of, uh, of, of you know, what might be loosely seen as Russian imperialism, but as well, you know, let's say a justification in the minds of, you know, even unto the Soviets, who some 
have, you know, some have called communism the ultimate form of Christianity, and, and, and one can also not forget that uh, Stalin was first and foremost a seminarian in his training. Whether there are resonances of this theme of the Third Rome, let's say, Panslavism, in, in your view, perhaps, you know, behind um, the adamancy with which the Russians, you know, were performing their policies. With, with this, our line is closed, okay? <laughs> so that, that, so that we have had our last uh, Okay. So, uh, first, a detail about what you said uh, concerning how Khrushchev was a fool in, in, in uh, announcing communism for the next 20 years. On um, um, this point, again, the Chinese communists did much better. There, there was, in 58, at the time of the, when the Great Leap was launched, uh, an high-ranking communist leader in Hubei province who officially announced that the communist era would begin in China, overall, in, in, over, all over China, on November 7, 1958, for the first, 41st anniversary of October Revolution. So this is just uh, uh, a small point. <laughs> now I will, I will just uh, say that I'm just recuperating from what you have inflicted on us. You, you first uh, uh, show to rehabilitate Stalin's sophistication. You, you showed, you took great pains to show how he, he was a clever, intelligent man. And without ever indulging in any moral condemnation, you, you just uh, always remaining on the level of the cool analysis, argumentation. Uh, you, you, you just demonstrated how, how he was a perfect, the archetypal monster, we just felt that implicitly, we, we felt our fault, and, and now you, you coolly demonstrated that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Vladimir Metin, so uh, Professor Graziosi, you have mentioned that Bolsheviks uh, try to implicate, I mean, involve uh, peasants in civil revolution, in civil war and so on. I think it's very important to mention that Lenin used uh, probably pragmatically this uh, slogan to give with peasants land. Uh, it was traditional demands of uh, peasants and the uh, uh, provisional government delayed with that and Lenin used this opportunity. And the question of giving land to uh, peasants is extremely important because Lenin probably was not advocate of this idea. It is his project to create collective farms and actually reclaim uh, lands back to peasants. And I have another uh, question, it's not specialist in 20th century. Uh, it's my impression that uh, Stalin himself, his personal is paranoia. And uh, he hate probably Ukrainian, and especially he afraid of this nationalism in Ukraine. We could call them Petlyubivts. Uh, that what, uh, you know, and in, in his terminology, it's always the term uh, used together with Pilsudski. I'm really have a doubt that in Ukraine, uh, between the war, for example, in eastern and southern Ukraine, it was people who sympathetic to Polish state. It was just his paranoia, uh, he feared a uh, Poles in, in the same instance as Ukrainian national media. This is just my question, if maybe you can comment. Nation. And, and as a student of nationalism, I have like a more of a conceptual question to continue your argument because to me that wasn't enough, unfortunately. Um, and my question would be, um, actually thank you for the clarification because nation building is a state effort and there's another thing called nation creation, the national imagination, which is basically in nationalism studies based on modernization, as you said, and, and on uh, urbanization and also on the effort of intellectuals. So I, I would separate the two where the authentic nation building would come from this effort, as we know from um, the intellectual movement to create history languages and so on. And then, as you said and, and, and uh, pointed out, the, the, the language in the urban centers was also really important. So for me, the question would be, um, would, the, you know, would, the, would the elevation of the Soviet state precisely and their uh, policies in russifying the urban centers all over the Soviet Union, and would the policy of kind of 
not only wiping out the, the national intelligence in 1937 and, and late 1930s and also 1950s in the Baltic states, um, but also the, the, the creation of this kind of like a loyal apparatus of intelligentsia and the whole conception of the Soviet intelligentsia that was following um, the concept of the authoritarian state that were not allowed um, to step into specific, precisely authentic intellectual national creation. Would, would that for you be kind of the, the continuation of this nation, national destroying or national destruction within the Soviet Union? Or would it only be separate into specific? Um, point of, of, of 1930. Thank you. Yes. So thank you. It's a long list of questions. So very briefly, I am not a Chinese specialist, of course, but I will stick with as far as the 1960-61 crisis and terrible famine, I will stick with Liu Shaohe theory that this was 7% uh, man-made, that is the communist product, and maybe 2-3% uh, natural reasons. Uh, and I think maybe even this is, you know, under-evaluating the, the, the communist policies. Uh, and this was shared by the party, and even Mao said this was true, basically. He accepted responsibility at that moment. Then, of course, he was very angry with Liu Shaoqi, and they take care in wiping him out. As to the Soviet Union, it's not true that they asked back for payment. Actually, Khrushchev offered very generous terms of repayment of the debts, and the Chinese refused them. So the Chinese refused. Actually, Khrushchev not only did not ask, but offered help, and he was refused. And, and I think this is typical of many dictators. If you think of what uh, Ceausescu did in Romania with the debt, it was very similar. That is, they do not withstand the idea of having debt because they are losing faith. So I think I cannot answer, but I think it's wrong to, to say that this was pro provoked by the, the Russian. Of course, the Russian, by retiring their advisor, did make things worse. But by 1960, the crisis was already there and was a product of Mao's uh, decision after the Russian conference. I think this has been proved. Could if I you want one to. Thing? Yes. So this is further specification. So with this, as to the Donbas, this is of course a very important question. I we had a big conference at Harvard on people, language, and nationalities in uh, in uh, and nations in in, uh, in the Ukrainian in June, and I would say that the, the common opinion is that the, the the Russian Russification, Russian presence, which are two different things in the Donbas, has very little to do with the Holodomor. Uh, the crucial moment is actually the, the Tsarist industrialization because you know that generally language uh, come to dominate uh, people when mass education is introduced. Mass uh, uh, obligatory, how to say, general education, primary general education. And Donbass being a modern the, the sector because of the steel mill, the mines, uh, it was one of the areas in which Mass education started earlier than in the villages and started in a period in which Ukrainian was forbidden. So you had alphabetization of the masses in Donbass cities in a period in which Ukrainian was forbidden, and so they were Russified because of this reason. So this is, I think, the original uh, motive of, of, of the fact that in, in the Donbass the, the Russian language uh, occupied such a big space. Then, of course, during the Holodomor, very, a, a few scores of thousands of Russians moved in, but it's not significant. It, it, it's significant, not as, as significant, this is my opinion, I've never studied this in great detail, but I discussed with specialists, because this, of course, in June was a very hot question. Uh, uh, the impression is that the key aspect of the Russification of the Donbass industrial centers, because this also is proved by today, because if you take the, you know, the two gu gubernia or oblasty, today the, 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 the rural parts are not as Russified, not at all. So it is the cities where the, the industrialization was carried out in the late 19th century, in a moment in which Ukrainian was forbidden, that are heavily Russified. 
The second important moment, not as important, came, as you said, uh, with World War II and after World War II. Then there was really a movement, but this is also true in Crimea. Now they speak that Crimea was always Russian. Crimea was never Russian, was never Ukrainian. No, it was not a policy. After the war, they, they had empty lands. Ukraine, well, Crimea was completely empty. You know, Khrushchev asked Crimea to be given to Russia, uh, to Ukraine, already in 44, I think. And he was denied. Uh, they had huge spaces. You know, the Tatars had been deported. The Germans had gone away with the German army. The Russian had been killed. The Ukrainian had been killed. So they had huge, you know, the Jews asked for Ukraine in 1946 for a Jewish Autonomous Republic. Because Crimea was empty. And much of Donbass was empty too. So the problem is that they had to repopulate this area. And of course they took, I, I wouldn't say, because for them Donbass was too internal. I think this was done on purpose more with the Baltics. In the Baltic Republic, they did this, I think, on purpose to, to direct population movement in order to make sure that there was a big Russian uh, presence in, and in Western Ukraine, of course, in the in the Molotov Ribbentrop, let's say lands, this was done, this was done. But but in the Donbas, it, it, it was done, but not it was there. I, I I agree with you. It's an important element. As to Panslavism, you know, th there is a certain element. You know, if you read the, the extreme Serbian right wing publication or the extreme uh, Bulgarian, uh, the, the, there are these elements, of course, and there are. Serbian fighters in the Donbas with the, with the, I don't know how to call them, there is a beautiful expression that Olga Andrievsky taught me, I will not repeat it in public, uh, uh, the, 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 the special detachment, let's call it this way. There, there are Serbian volunteers there, as far as I know, but, you know, I, I, for the reason we discussed today, not, of course this was a closed session, but you have to think that the, the, the 1930s really were a break also for the Russian culture and church. I spoke today of the destruction of Ukrainian culture, but you can speak of the 1930s as destruction of Russian culture too, and certainly of the Russian Orthodox culture and of Russian traditional Panslavism. By, by the end of the 30s, there were no priests left alive. The, the Russian Orthodox Church that is alive today is a creation of Stalin. It's, there is almost no continuity with the old one. I think 92%, I don't remember, it's the single category that suffered the most in the Soviet Union, the Orthodox popes. This one has to remember, because otherwise one thing that the persecution was only the, the Russian Orthodox Church, I am not an Orthodox uh, <laughs> believer at all, but one is, it's true, they were destroyed. In, in a way, you know, the term genocide, as far as the United Nations Convention, applies to the Russian Orthodox Church perfectly, what was done to them. And then they were recreated in, in 1953, by, uh, 43 by Stalin. So there is an element of continuity cultural, but I would say that the break of the 1930s is extremely new. And when in 46, for example, they create this new, they have just created this new Russian Orthodox Church that has been, you know, a lot of this, a few bishops are taken out of the camps, but many are just uh, KGB creations. You know, and they give them control over the, the, the Greek uh, Catholic Church. And, and this is really, and they start Panslavism again and the big church conferences. But this is all uh, Stalin's creation in a way. It's all new. It, it is a concoction of old elements, but it's a lot of novelty. Uh, has to, to the, the, the problem with Stalin, yes. Uh, well, it is, it's not a morality play. That is, how can you, how can you, uh, if you read these letters, if you read the comments to the death sentence and the torture he ordered for his friends, if you read, you are in the presence of a cold monster. This is, uh, if you, but why, so I come here and I lecture that Stalin is a cold monster. It's too easy. <laughs> that is, it's true, but but uh, doesn't explain. I try to explain how this person and, and why he was so powerful. Because remember, this was a very powerful person. It, I, I, I already told today, if you read Molotov memoirs, Molotov, you know, Molotov's wife was in a concentration camp. 
Molotov didn't like this. He always liked, you know, to have his wife back. <laughs> and still, in his memoirs, he says, memoirs, the conversation, he says, Stalin is immense. But, but, you know, it's, it's not a meaningless word, immense. What does it mean, immense? That is a person, Molotov was not a stupid or a weakling, right? What does it mean for a powerful, mean leader like Molotov? to sit beside a person who has put his wife in a concentration camp and continue to think that this person is immense. What kind of power has this person on, on even a person like Molotov? So you are dealing with very powerful personalities and unless you, you, you confront this, it's very you know, difficult to understand why they could do what they did. You know, this is, I tried to show this. So. As to Lenin and peasants, yes, of course, <laughs> Lenin, Lenin knew very well. I, I spoke of these tensions. I didn't say there was no contradiction. I said there was a contradiction. When you take the reactionary forces and you make a, a, a socialist revolution using nationalities and peasants, of course you're going to have problems. So you say, that, that, but I wouldn't be happy with what, you know, Lenin was an opportunist. Because if you are simply an opportunist, you don't go too far. Because people realize you are using them. Uh, Lenin actually believed he, he, he could do this. That he could use peasant and nationalities and he could mobilize them and then he could make a deal with them, with the NEP, and then he could... Because he believed in, the, in politics. And, and, you know, politics is a... It's a very sophisticated thing. It's, you cannot say a great politician is an opportunist. I don't think this helps you understand. And, and the, in a way, from this point of view, Lenin certainly is one of the greatest politicians of the 20th century. If you think how many things he invented, uh, we still have in China the, the Leninist system, the, polit the party state, which is Lenin's invention, is still in power in China. I think the Politburo still meets in the same day in which Lenin appointed, I don't know when it meets in China, but for many years they, have, they met on Thursday, I think, morning, at the, at the hour, you know, and, and, and they have a secretary that deals with the central committee in a certain way. These were inventions, you know, these are not banalities if you invent the party state or, or the use of the party or so on and so forth. These, these are very great thinkers, even we may dislike them, but if we don't realize how innovative they are, you, you don't go too far, even in fighting them in a way, because, uh, again, this already I treated, Stalin had paranoia. Yes, yeah, Stalin was an obsessive compulsion personality of the greatest. I, I, if I invite you, if it happened, you to, this is very easy, but now these are in books. If you take the list of the people, of the categories that make up the first great mass operation of terror, what we call the terror, and now we know that the real name was mass operation, right, uh, of 1937. This is a list of categories of possible enemies that has been taught about for weeks and weeks and think categories have been added and changed and specified and then new categories came. So this is a person that is always thinking what are the possible enemies and what is the level of danger. So we have first category enemies, second category enemies. So this is a complete, in a, so yes, a complete paranoia. But is it paranoia? But it's also, you know, thinking every day about power. So you could also say this. And you know, when you, when you read the list and you discover, yes, there are the former priests, there are the former social revolu socialist revolutionaries, the former anarchists, the former member of party opposition, in Communist Party opposition. There are the former leaders of peasants' revolt. There are the, all the people that have been sentenced to three years or more because they do not like us, even if they've been sentenced because they stole something or they, they beat uh, a person in the street. So that, that this is a long list of enemies because the internal enemies has to be, you know, detailed into precise categories and these are these are reworked over and over and over between 37 and 38. This is very impressive as far as the mind goes. So, yes, paranoia, but uh, it's not that you are saying that it's a weak element. This is what I'm saying. Uh, 
the last question, and then we finish, about Russian and, and the Soviet and the use of Russian. Again, this is history. You cannot, you cannot say uh, the politics toward Russian and Russian nationalism changed continuously up to the mid 30s. The, the, you, before 1932, 33, of course, you can say that already during the Polish Russian War of 19, you know, the bit after the Civil War, there were elements of Russian nationalism that were used, that in 1931, to answer the crisis that the policy had provoked, he was using Russian rhetorics again. But before the mid-30s, Stalin actually uh, did as much damage to Russian national elements and national building as he did to other nationalities. And he certainly didn't care for the Russians. The, 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 there is an evolution. Stalin starts to care about the Russian when he discovered that he can solve to you to solve the crisis his policies had provoked. Russian nationalism is a very powerful tool to stabilize. So, and Russian language, and, and because the new bureaucracy likes the degrees power. So there is a big switch. And then World War II bring, brings another big switch. So there is the famous toast in 46, no, in 45, at the you know, parade, the victory parade. This is a toast to the Russian people. But the to if you read the toast to the Russian people, he says, I am having this toast to the Russian people because actually in 41 they could have kicked, him out, kicked me out because I was not good for them or to them. So the, the relation between the regime and the Russian and Russian nation is stabilized only during the war, I would say. And then becomes a, an intrinsic element. But, but before there is a long story of, you know, turns and things. And, and I think from this point of view, we start, and with this I finish, with, since we are doing nationalism, we clearly the war, but this is obvious, the war is Stalin's latest great lesson, right? You are having a war every day for five years, such a war. And then the Cold War, it's forced you to reconsider all your categories every day. The war is the latest, the, the, the last great, you know, self uh, learning, how to say, so, 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 yes, so, that you are learning something new. And clearly, out of the war, Stalin gets a, an ethnic vision of the world. So there are the Germans, but this is not illogic. After all, he was fighting against Germans, he had an Ukrainian problem, he had Jews problem, he had the, the Italian Mussolini, he had the. So he's reading the world in very, very solidly ethnic terms after the war. But this is not because, because the war is, in Europe, has been a very nationalizing experience. And if you think that all over the world, in France, in Italy, there have been national liberation movement. So it, it's the war that is imposing a, a national framework that is very strong upon Europe again, I would say. And I, I think so, but you cannot project this into the past, I think. So thank you very much. So as I promised you, he's a great lecturer, and that's not even taking into account the great glasses he has. <laughs> uh, we have come to the end of our conference. Uh, the planning of every conference takes a long time. The cajoling of speakers to come takes a long time. Uh, and uh, then you have to see what, what's going to be created. We have been very fortunate. We have been speakers who have been willing to engage, to go beyond normal boundaries of regional studies and even interdisciplinary studies in order to address the problems uh, we have posed and asked and we have discussed uh, over a number of days. We've also been fortunate that uh, a number of graduate students and early career scholars uh, have answered our call and come here. Uh, I think it's been one of the strong parts of our conference uh, 
that is uh, that uh, the graduate students and the young scholars have been willing to educate their elders at this conference. Uh, always good for these sessions, and I think that exchange has been open, free, and, uh, and certainly edifying to me. Uh, I, I uh, also uh, have been quite impressed by the large numbers of, of both students from the University of Toronto, faculty from the University of Toronto, but general community who have come to our conference. We are very fortunate here in Toronto for a number of reasons, and particularly for the co-sponsors that we have had uh, with our conference. Uh, the uh, Peter Yatsik, Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine at the Center for European and Russian and Eurasian Studies, I think one can in fairness say has one of the richest programs internationally on, on a yearly basis of offerings on Ukrainian topics and bring people from all over to the university. And, they have, co as always, have cooperated with our conference. Uh, we have been fortunate this time to co-sponsor with the Asian Institute of the Monk Center, and anyone who was at Professor Bianco's lecture uh, was impressed by how many students of Chinese studies uh, came to that lecture. Uh, it certainly lowered the average age greatly for an academic endeavor, and that was good. And it also showed us that our colleagues in Chinese studies somehow have charms or ways of persuasion. Uh, not that they needed that much to, to attract to such a great scholar, but to get undergraduates out on a Friday evening, I tell you, <laughs> is not always an easy thing. And we saw many, many of them uh, at, that ev at that event. We have the, the, the Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center upstairs. We'll be asking you to come up to a reception there soon. It is a, a unique institution in, in North America and internationally that is a community organization backing research, collecting archives, uh, makes Toronto a, a center particularly for oral history for those who want to study Ukrainian oral history and not only on Ukraine and we're very proud of that, of that institution. We are fortunate to have the St. Vladimir Institute and right near the University of Asis. This was, as I outlined to those who were at an earlier talk, uh, this was the foresight in many ways of a movement that started in Canada before the First World War to establish such institutes at major universities. Uh, and it is certainly gives Canada a great strength and, and I, comparatively to the US, which of course Canadians always do, uh, there are no comparable institutions in the US and it makes the two communities very different, particularly in their outreach for academic affairs. Uh, we have the Canadian Foundation of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, for Ukrainian Studies, uh, which uh, sponsors and assists programs at higher educational institutions throughout Canada in Ukrainian Studies and always comes through to assist us and particularly for all of our Hello the More programs has consistently given us support. Um, and above all, uh, we have our sponsor, uh, the uh, Temerte Family Foundation, which has made it possible uh, to invite such, uh, such a renowned group of scholars and many from quite far away. Uh, and we've been pleased uh, to be able to bring them here and know that these contacts will continue for a long time. Now, all these institution staffs have worked very hard uh, to bring this conference uh, to fruition, and we are grateful to all of them. Two people we have to single out, uh, I think, for this, and one is Andriy Makuk, uh, who is taken from our institute and in the scholarly activity. Andri has dealt with the not always easy group of scholars to get them here, to get them to get their papers in on time, and that's been one of the great, I think, benefits that we have, we have brought them. Uh, it's a pleasant group, he says. <laughs> and above all, the executive director of REC, uh, Bartha Baziuk, who has worked so hard to bring this conference to a successful fruition. And I invite you upstairs to uh, the Documentation Center and where we have our Holodomor Research Office, uh, uh, Research Office. Uh, you, our scholars will be with us and, and uh, it can give you a chance to talk with them about the topics you're interested in. So please join us for the reception. Thank you.